This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon and welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Lily Ong, and we have with us today um, Dr. Patricio Abinales, who's a professor of Asian Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Welcome, Professor. Thank you, Lily, for the yeah. invitation. Yeah. And you're here with us today to talk about Mindanao, an island in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. uh, would you mind giving us some historical background on the in, uh, Mindanao place? Yeah. Mindanao is the second biggest island in the Philippines, the size of Scotland, and they say slightly bigger than, slightly smaller than Portugal. Um, it has a long history, uh, weird, strange history with the, the relationship to the Philippine nation state in part because for a while it was dominated by Muslims who never saw themselves as Filipinos. Up until the coming of the American colonizers in the 1900s, most of Mindanao was trading with Southeast Asia. So you have all these Muslim sultanates who always thought of themselves as Southeast Asian traders, uh, fluent in six, seven languages and could uh, trading as far back as far out as uh, northern china uh so, yeah and then to singapore of mm. course everything that of the trade was going on singapore and all through java in, uh, dutch java in 1900 the american the spaniards uh, the spanish colonizers which preceded the americans tried to colonize it but for most part of 300 years of spanish rule the only time the spanish were able to control mindanao was in the last 40 years of the rule for most part Mindanao was autonomous and independent from the Spanish colonial authority. It was the coming of the Americans, however, with weaponry and the weakening of the Sultanate in the trade with Southeast Asia. The British took over Singapore and now reoriented Singapore as a, as a, sta a jumping po point of, of drugs, of opium to Chow in China. It wasn't instant spices anymore. The Sultanates weakened, weakened and the Spaniard, and Americans then came in and easily defeated them. But the interesting thing about it is after having defeated them, the Americans then became their teachers. They set up a public school system in order to possibly educate and civilize the Muslims, the different kinds of Muslim groups. And as a result, there were a couple of result, uh, results of that were two things that happened. One, the emergence of a Muslim elite mm. that was fluent in English. This first generation would talk like they're from Ohio. Uh, then the, the, uh, the introduction of public education among the Muslims made them supportive of and appreciative of American colonial rule, which ran against the plan of the Americans in the North to integrate Muslim Mindanao to the rest of the colony and be governed, be governed by Filipinos. So throughout its history, most of Mindanao's Muslim minor com uh, communities never imagined themselves as Filipinos, even I think up to today. Now, the second important thing about Mindanao was after World War II, when, as a result of the devastation of the war, uh, Filipino families from the central and northern Philippines started to move down Mindanao because it was perceived as the land of promise. There was a lot of land in it. Uh, in fact, my family moved in the 50s from central Philippines, both sides of my family, into the town where I grew up, which is Ozami City. Uh, which gained notoriety of late, but I can talk about it later. And I'm just wondering, with all these different colonial masters coming in, um, mm -hmm. did the locals develop any kind of affinity for them? Well, the odd thing, yeah, here's yeah. the odd thing, that in 2004, uh, there was a survey done by a local uh, polling group asking Muslims if they approved of Americans uh, doing combat joint military exercises with the Philippine military in the South. 60% of Muslims said yes. Um, um, so, the, and when I was doing research there in, the two, in about 2008, 2009, I was looking at how U.S. agency in, in, for international development programs succeeded, why they were succeeding in war zones where the Muslims were active. It had partly something to do with two things. One, Muslims look at uh, the Americans as a buffer between their communities and the Philippine military that was trying to destroy them. And the second, actually, what was more interesting is Muslims um, were appreciative that the Americans came in and said, we're going to do business with you. We're not interfering with your religion. We're going to set you up as entrepreneurs. And that's how this project succeeded. So whereas at the other end, and the Philippine government has been notoriously corrupt when it came to Muslim Mindanao, 
a uh, lot of the resources that the government allotted went into the hands of Muslim elite, uh, political families who then used it for their own needs. So it's, Muslim Mindanao is one of the worst, mo poorest regions of the world, uh, of the country, uh, in part because whatever resources coming in from Manila are appropriated and stolen by the Muslim elite, which meant then for the Muslim communities, uh, the most successful projects, the USAID projects, and the ones are evidence of how the Americans took them seriously. So up to now, for example, the joke is if you fly an American flag in the war zones, you don't get kidnapped. <laughs> if you fly a Japanese or French flag or even a Philippine flag, mm -hmm. one o'clock in the afternoon, you better run. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like the Muslim populations and the Filipino populations, they're not exactly talking to each other. Have either side approached the Americans to you know, integrate the two? Well, the Filipinos actually began to populate Mindanao only after World War II. So everybody didn't want to go to Mindanao because it was the border, the frontier, mm -hmm. scary Muslims, you know, no smugglers and killers are all found there. Um, that was something that I had to bear with and people in Manila referred to me as someone from Mindanao. Um, so in 46, Filipino communities began, communities began to migrate in large numbers down to the eastern and northern portion of Mindanao. So the, the for example, the, the, the family of the current president moved in after 1950 in this place called Davao. So they, they went to the areas where Muslims were either negligible in present, in terms of their presence, and also areas where the forest had already been cleaned up. So much of Mindanao, the Filipino side of Mindanao, only emerged in the 1960s. Over one million people moved in. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned Davao. Is that the most populous city in Mindanao? Uh, yeah, it's supposed to be the largest city in Mindanao. Is it also the cradle of prosperity? Is that Well, it's an interesting history because Davao was seen at the early start of the American period as the frontier with nobody goes to the back border. But then the Japanese, uh, Japanese uh, settlers came in in 1912 and turned Davao into the center of the hemp industry in the world. So 30,000 Japanese, actually they were all Okinawans, moved to, Jap to, to Davao and developed and cultivated the abak, the hemp industry, until 1941. And after which, when the Americans came back after World War II, they were all deported to Japan. Those lands then became the basis for, uh, they, were so, or they were already developed at such that in the 60s and 70s, American corporations came in to plant pineapple and bananas which were then exported to Japan and the Middle East. So it's, very, it's a very, very, it's one of the fastest growing in terms of economic uh, development of agriculture. Mm -hmm. Davao is actually one of, in, in fact, the fastest growing of uh, provinces in Mindanao. And it still is. You know. And not just in Mindanao, I think uh, Mindanao itself is actually the food basket of Philippines, mm -hmm. is that yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Food basket in the sense that uh, South of where the Muslim commu uh, community in central Mindanao are located used to be the rice, uh, uh, rich rice lands. And there's a problem with El Nino today, a lot of the rice were coming or being produced there. Food basket is yes, Davao, yeah, Davao is actually you know, mangoes, ev uh, everything, mangoes, fruits, even durian, you know, you get from Davao. <laughs> yeah, durian is your Singaporean yeah. plow. And uh, so it's been that. I mean, so that's on one side of Mindanao, but people in the Philippines, in Manila especially, are not familiar with this. They only think that they get mangoes and bananas from Davao. Davao, and but you know, this is a thriving. That part of Mindanao is a very thriving industry that's connected to global market as far back as the 1900s. Mm. Um, and the other side, actually, is Zamboanga City, um, which is a city that faces Borneo, and but it trades with Singapore, right? So Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, and Indonesia. Most of the trade is called smuggling. It's referred to smuggling, but if you look at where most of the Muslim communities rely on their commodities and their household goods, it's in the trade. It's a trade where everybody can buy a Malaysian five-in-one coffee. Uh, as I told you earlier, my mother's favorite Singaporean umbrellas uh, were course to that area. I used to grow, I grew up with Cadbury chocolates, which were still British-owned until the, an American company bought it and um, Indonesian mallow and um, sambal, of course. What is so special about Singaporean umbrellas? I guess I grew up with them. I didn't think... Well, apparently, it, uh, in the history of Singapore, uh, 
the, the, the production of Singapore umbrellas were better than the rest of Southeast Asia. So they were always seen as top quality, I think in part because it was a British colony. Uh, so having a, as it were, Western-made umbrella was a sign of uh, higher status in small villages like mine. You, know, you didn't buy American umbrellas or Chinese umbrellas because they're bad and crappy. Singapore umbrellas are efficient and, you know, and, and long-lasting, and if not colorful. So I was growing up in my hometown, and that was my mindset about umbrellas. Up to now, I wouldn't buy any umbrella unless they're made in Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks for letting me know. I didn't, I didn't know that. Now, so would you say that food export is the main industry driver? Mm -hmm. yeah. It is, uh, in part also uh, as a result of the development of food crops in places like Davao. Uh, the tuna industry also developed as a result of that. Uh, a student of ours, former student of ours, who now finished PhD in the University of Wisconsin, studied the relationship between the tuna industry and the Japanese community in Davao and found out that if you were to talk about southern Philippine tuna or northern Indonesian tuna production, it's connected to the needs of this Japanese community. Because the Japanese community did not uh, ha have the time to grow uh, to, to you know, for hog industry or to, to rear bad cattle. So tuna was the end of that. Um, its importance as a food basket also was appreciated by the Japanese, such that in, during World War II, the Japanese Navy took, took control of Mindanao not the army, in part because Mindanao was a food basket for whatever, if its troops, you know, would not last long throughout Southeast Asia. But it was also the connecting connection to Indonesia where oil was supposedly being tapped. Mm. So it's an interesting island. If you talk to somebody from Manila, it's a scary place. But if you talk to the to people in Mindanao, I come from there, I'm a little bit biased, is that we are actually the center of the world. Mm -hmm. We trade with Japan, we trade with Singapore. Our smugglers are fluent in six or seven <laughs> languages, um, and we can go in and out of Indonesia. Um, and, and so there is this very bizarre distinction that the result partly of the different histories that Mind of Mindanao and the Philippines in regard to the colonization of the archipelago. Mm -hmm. So given the historical connections, do you see a lot of Japanese there today? No, there's actually, so they were all deported after World War II back to Okinawa. And, and southern Japan, Kyushu. But the children, some of the children were left. So there are now Okinawan associations in places like Davao because people were trying to trace their Japanese ancestry. But also, those kids who were born in Davao and deported to Okinawa of rich retirement age and are coming back and say, where did I come from? Where was I born? So with the eve of World War II, for example, uh, Davao was called Davao Ko. Is Japanese for city. And there was a weird, bizarre Davao language that included Filipino with Cebuano, which is a language of uh, southern Philippines, and Japanese. And so these kids then wanted to go back. They write, they've gone back and they've actually helped set up the associations. If you go to Okinawa, the, some of the novels about, some of the memoirs about these people actually talk about growing up in Davao. So, so there's that interesting connection in Davao. And then to give you more spice the story, the, the island story, at the other end, the west of Zamboanga City, uh, every fair-looking Hapa Zamboangueño think that they were the children of General Pershing. The Americans, the American army set up its headquarters in this in Zamboanga City, the one facing Borneo. And up to now, if you uh, if you go to Zamboanga City, the center of town is not the statue of the Philippine national hero but a, a, thing, a, a place called Plaza Pershing, mm -hmm. named after John per, uh, General Jack Pershing, mm -hmm. who was the last gov military governor of the American in, 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 in Mindanao. That's so there's right. a very strange uh, relationship between Mindanaoans and uh, foreigners, mm -hmm. Japanese and Americans, but also Mindanaoans and the colonial masters, especially the Americans. Well, talking about the Davako and the, the different names, um, I know that um, Mindanao is also dubbed the land of the promise. So we're going to take a little break here. When we come back, we're going to discuss more with Professor Abinales on Mindanao. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello everyone, I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha, I'm Richard Concepcion, the host of Hispanic Hawaii. You can watch my show every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. We will bring you entertainment, educational, and also we tell you what is happening right here within our community. Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Lily Ong, and we have with us today Professor Abinalas from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, in the first half, we talked about the historical background of Mindanao. We're going to now go into some of the challenges that Mindanao faces today. Um, Professor, perhaps starting from 1960, would you um, educate us on some of the violent conflict that have occurred back then? Yeah, so Mindanao is always seen as a violent land, and there's something to do with the conflict in 19 the 1970s, which was a result of the flood frontier closing, people competing for whatever left of the land, but also a national government becoming more and more assertive, and which an assertion, assertive government which the Muslim minority saw as an attempt to exterminate them, their li way of life. So Muslims in the 1960s and politicians and student activists began to band together for f in defense of Muslim identity and culture against you know, the enroachment of settlers, but also the enroachment of Manila. That group eventually got the attention of Muammar Gaddafi in Libya, and Libya said, we will send arms and training for you. So in, the 19, in 1974, the Moro National Liberation Front was formed. It was an armed group supported by Libya and Malaysia, which is another story, and it wanted to fight for, to separate Mindanao the Sulu Archipelago, which is from south to the main island, and the Palawan Island, in the, cent the west central part of the Philippines, separated from the Philippines and create a different republic. The argument being that not only the Muslims owned the land, and they were never, you know, become, never ever really treated as Filipinos, but we actually had a different country that was artificially integrated into the Republic of the Philippines. The war started in 1975. It was one of the intent, most intense battles in the 70s. Um, my cousin actually was in the military. I told my best friends who killed that war. But in 1977, both sides began to negotiate, but never withdrew their arms. So the, there was intermittent clashes. And in 1978, late 80s, another group came out. Just, just wondering, how long was the negotiation process? Oh, God, it took 20 years because it was back and forth, back and forth. Mm -hmm. And it all depended whether uh, Libya was happy about it or Malaysia was happy about it. So they were hosting this group. So were Libya and Malaysia the only other third parties involved in the negotiations? In the initial negotiations until uh, 1989. Um, so another group emerged out of the Moro National Liberation Front, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, which is the breakaway faction of that group, and it's now the strongest group, armed group, Philippine Muslim, Muslim armed group in Mindanao. It's a negotiation with the Philippine government that it has kept its 14,000 strong army. So, but to go back in 1996, um, 19, no, 1989, the, and, and the government of President Marcos was replaced by a more democratic government, and that, that government decided to negotiate a final peace agreement with the first organization. They signed it in 1996. The Moro National Liberation Front integrated its forces into the police, sent its guerrillas back to the farms, um, and its leaders became part of the provincial government. Um, that was at the, in the, assist, with the assistance not anymore with the Libyans, because the Libyans lost interest in, in, in Mindanao, but the Malaysians and oddly the United States. What was the reason for the Libyans losing their interest? Was there uh, they got distracted by, uh, I mean, uh, Libya, was, uh, remembering the, the, the 
concerns in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. I was weakening Libya's position vis-a-vis -vis the other Arab countries, but also the decline in oil prices made it limited, uh, limited uh, Libya's capacity to provide support to the Philippines. The third was the fall of the, East, uh, the Berlin Wall. So uh, Libya's closest allies, the East Europeans, now could not, well, were not there anymore. They've been integrated into the West, the Western Europe. So for example, the most important anti-tank trainers of all these guerrillas in, in, in Mindanao were East German specialists. But now that East Germany had disappeared, these guys have disappeared too. It's another story in itself. So that decline, and Malaysia was tired of hosting uh, the training camps in Borneo of the MNLF and got tired of the corruption in the organization uh, that then it, saw, it pressured the Philippine government to negotiate. And the Muslims actually said, well, maybe we should bring in the Americans too. They were kind to us. So in 1984, uh, 2004 actually, uh, the Americans formally participated in the mediation process of the different groups. And in 1996, to go back, USAID also participated in the rehabilitation of the war zones. It's been there for the last 20 years. So with USAID and Americans coming in, did you see more of a progress in the negotiation process? Yes, I think a lot. Uh, the old organization, the first organization, is completely integrated into the politics, mm -hmm. the local politics of Mindanao. Now they have this, you know, they have a few armed men, but that's normal in Philippine politics. Every politician has their own private armies. Um, and then they cease to be a threat. The Malaysian government said, "Enough, you know, we're not hosting you anymore. Go mm -hmm. home." Um, the a second group, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, uh, has kept itself intact. But it's also very pragmatic. It says, you know, if, as long as you keep out of our territory, we'd be willing to talk peace. Mm -hmm. So now they're in conversation with the government vis-a-vis -vis the forming of a new autonomous region in which the MILF would be the governing body. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned guerrillas. So was the warfare more like a hybrid warfare? or was Initially, it, it was a conventional war. Mm -hmm. uh, my uh, cousin who was in the army said, we had to fight an army itself that was supplied by Libya with guns to toilet paper. The Philippine army was inadequately of a fight. And, but then the, the, the Muslim rebels realized that they could not do fight a continuing conventional war with a Philippine military that was supplied with tanks and aircraft. So they tried to shift to guerrilla warfare, and that sort of the warfare continued while the peace, agreement, peace negotiations were being conducted. Mm -hmm. If you go to Mindanao, now it's a very strange place, this very Muslim zone. You go to a military checkpoint, you have to look at the uniform and say, okay, that's army. The next military checkpoint, ah, it's more national liberation front. <laughs> so the next, ah, more Islamic mm -hmm. liberation front. So you, you adjust in, way, in terms of which military checkpoint you go through. It's a fun exercise, but you know. Mm -hmm. I always get exciting you know, stories when I go to this area. And during the negotiation, just wondering, what kind of bargaining instruments did the, um, the Americans bring onto the table? Aid. Aid. The America, um, the, uh, uh, it was under President George Bush, actually, we said, okay, we have $40 million to, to spend mm -hmm. in the rehabilitation programs of Muslim guerrillas. USAID implemented it in 1996, and by the end of the fifth year, 14,000 of these guerrillas had been reintegrated into their communities with new livelihood projects. Uh, the Americans didn't bring in money, they just bring expertise and technology. So 14,000 of the 20,000 armed force of the Moro National Liberation Front became farmers. But it's a very, it was a very interesting arrangement because Normally, in peace processes, you want the rebel groups to disarm. USA, they said, no, you can keep your arms because the police is weak, the army is corrupt. You have to protect your corn. You have to protect your in seaweed industry. You have to protect your uh, poultry and fishing industries. And so it, we used to joke that instead of arms into farms, you said farms with arms. So, and it was very successful. I mean, it's the model now for this new group, it's the other group, the Moro National in, uh, Islamic Liberation Front, a model that they want implemented when the peace agreement is finally signed. Mm -hmm. And along with aid, do they come with strings? Do they set a no, timeline no, no. on you've got to accomplish this by this certain and, deadline? Well, no, and I think this is why the Muslims appreciated the Americans more. The American USAID said, we'll give you two years, 
we have the technology and the expertise, we'll not give you money, and after two years, we'll leave you alone. All profits from your industry, from reliability projects, go to you. And we don't care where you get the counterpart funds. So in Sulu, for example, in Tawita, Sulu Island, uh, you have this 100-mile uh, uh, fish sanctuaries protected by big towers and with machine guns by the Moro National Liberation Front cadre. The, 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 uh, the towers were funded by USAID, but the guns were from you know, uh, the MNLF. You have schools, for example, in really, really poor places with computers, which was a product of USAID saying we have 20 computers, we want you to come out with counterpart 20 computers, we don't care how you get it. So the, smuggler fa the smuggling family, the families involved in smugglers, then, oh, raise the fund, join the PTA, and raise the... So these kind of interesting, fascinating yeah. stories that you don't see if you're in the capital in Washington is happening in Mindanao. Yeah. Uh, which balances the idea that it's always a conflict zone. And this is a final point on the conflict. The, actually, the violence in Mindanao is more perpetrated by warlords, political families who are constantly fighting each other. The two most violent incidents in the la last decade and now in Mindanao were perpetrated by Muslim clans fighting each other. Mm -hmm. Do you see these conflicts being contained to Mindanao, or is there a possibility of radiation to other parts of the Philippines or even the region? Uh, the second one, the one that happened in Marawi City, has the possibility of spreading to the region because one side of the tribal group were ki the kids of a family that were trained in ISIS. Mm -hmm. uh, there was an attempt in the, se in the 90s, actually, by Jema Islamiyah of Indonesia to penetrate that area. Oddly, the more Islamic Liberation Front mm -hmm. kicked them out. Because, and this is Philippine Islam, we can talk about this next time. Philippine Islam, the uh, Jema Islamiyah uh, fun, uh, fun, fundamentalists began dictating uh, the, to the MILF what to do with their women. I see. And well, I wish we had more time, yeah. but we're coming towards the end of the show. Yeah. Would you very quickly demystify for us why Mindanao is also dot the land of the promise? There's so much land, very rich in mineral resources, uh, fish, fish uh, food but also mining. The Chinese are interested in the copper and the gold mines, for example. It's the richest part of the island, but it's also the poorest because of its weird, uh, bizarre history. And do you see a, see a way forward from here? Do you see Mindanao well, getting past the Well, the only thing the that will keep Mindanao developed, that will allow Mindanao to develop, is autonomy. Most of the revenues that banks, offices earn in Manila at the end of the day, and in the end of the day, get remitted back to Manila. So we call Manila Imperial Manila. Mm. Some of us want to separate Mindanao, but that, that's next to impossible now. Okay. So Mindanao is a little bit of a troubled land of promise today, but a land of promise nonetheless. Well, thank you so much, Professor Avinala. It's such for a pleasure me. to have you with us today. Likewise. And we'll look forward to the next time when we see you again. Thank you. Thank you.